Hebrews chapter 10. And actually, I'm going to switch that. Sorry. Let's open to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. There's this really interesting concept throughout the book of Hebrews about the heart. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it talks about how God is knows the intent and the thoughts of our hearts. And when you think about those two words, he knows the intent. He knows what, uh, what our motivations are. He knows what we are intending to do, even when we don't do it how we thought it would work out. But also he knows the thoughts of our hearts. He knows what we're thinking. Um, and, and so he knows us really to our very core is the idea. And that's why in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, he can say, if you look with me in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. That's why he can say that these Israelites that he's referring to had an evil heart of unbelief. Uh, but on the flip side of that, he says in Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, verse 22, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, he says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. And so you have this, this contrast. You have the evil heart of unbelief. You have the true heart in full assurance of faith. And the idea is that God knows which kind of heart you have, which kind of heart you are trying to have. And so, you know, if you have an evil heart, you might can fool other people. You might even can fool yourself. But you can't fool God. But, but likewise, God knows if you are, are trying to have a true heart in full assurance of faith. You know, I want to look at one aspect this morning of a true heart. Uh, there's a lot of aspects in the book of Hebrews about having a true heart, but I assume that you don't want to be here until Thursday. So we'll just look at one of them this morning. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. He says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And so here he's talking about wanting to stir up love and good works. And he says the way that you do that, the way you stir up love and good works, in verse 24, is to, first of all, consider one another. It's this idea that we need to spend some time thinking about our brothers and sisters in Christ. Not the way that we sometimes think about them, right? You know, uh, a brother so-and-so, uh, he's a nice person, but he sure has an annoying voice, right? You know, I, I don't really like talking to him that much. Or, or you know, sister so-and-so, she, she always wears her hair so big, and when she sits in front of me, I can't see the preacher. Or maybe that's a good thing, right? Because then he doesn't know if you fall asleep. And so, But, you know, we, we have a tendency to find our faults, find complaints in each other. But here he's talking about this idea that you are considering one another. You're trying to think about each other's motivations. You're trying to think about each other's, uh, what's going to encourage you to stir up love and good works. And so, you know, you think this sister over here, she, you know, she has some problems. You know, she has some issues that she's dealing with, some struggles in her life. And you're thinking, you know these things about her. How can I stir up her love and good works to help her overcome those, to help her fight through those issues? And so you want to spend some time thinking about that. Or, you know, this brother over here, he has so many talents and gifts that he could use for God, but he's hesitant to do that. How can I stir up love for him to do that? How can I stir up good works? So we need to spend time thinking about that. He continues in verse 25 and says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And so the idea here is that as you consider one another, what you're really considering is when I am with that person, when I am with my brothers and sisters in Christ, how can I stir up love and good works? Uh, he says, not forsaking, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so he almost repeats himself here. Exhortation, the idea that you encourage people, and this is how you encourage them. You stir up love and good works. And so we know that this is something that we need to do, but we might ask ourselves why. Why is it that he's commanding us to do that? And it's important to note that it is a command. He says, consider one another. Stir up love and good works. Don't forsake the assembling. Exhort one another. These are not polite suggestions. These are commands that we need to know is essential for each and every person who's a member of the body of Christ. And, and he encouraged us to, to do that because of what he says in verse 26. Verse 26, he says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of uh, the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. The idea that he's getting at here is that when we separate ourselves from the body, 
And when we become a negative force in the body by not stirring up love and good works, or by uh, having a negative attitude, there's something about being apart from the body that causes your heart to harden. Remember the heart that we're talking about, an evil heart versus a true heart. When we separate ourselves from the body, and we choose not to spend time with them, our heart starts to harden, and suddenly we get to this point where we sin, and we don't care so much about repenting. There's something about being together that softens our hearts. And, and that's what he's getting at here in verse 26. Now, when I read a Bible passage like this, I think, you know, this is good. I want to do this. But the question always is, how do you do it practically? That's what I really want to know. How do I actually go about doing that? And he talks about that in chapter 13. If you turn with me to chapter 13, talking about, really, you could say that this chapter is how to stir up love and good works. And he says in chapter 13 and verse 1, he says, let brotherly love continue. Yeah, this is how you stir up love and good works. And the idea here of continuing is it does have some to do with, you know, you need to keep on doing it. That's certainly implied. But the word for continue really carries with it the kind of connotation of leave it. Leave brotherly love where God has put it. You know, it's kind of like if you've ever had a new puppy, you know, new puppies, they really love to chew things, right? You know, they, they get your, your favorite pair of socks, they get your, your kid's favorite toy, and they chew them up. And so you start to train them not to do that thing. And, and so you go about training them, and, and you kind of get to a place where, where they recognize uh, that when you say, leave it, when they go for whatever it is they're trying to get, and you say, leave it, they kind of stop, and they look at you, and that's what you want, right? You want to engage with them, and they, they learn not to do that thing anymore. Well, that's kind of the idea here that he's getting at when he says, let brotherly love continue. That word for continue is the idea that God has set a standard for brotherly love. And, you know, sometimes we don't feel like doing those things. And, and through chapter 13, he's going to give us essentially some commands, some ways that we let brotherly love continue, that we stir up love and good works. And sometimes we don't feel like doing those things. But when we feel that way, it's kind of like God says, leave it. Let brotherly love continue. Do the things that he talks about here. And so let's look at some of these quickly. Uh, in verse 2, he talks about entertaining strangers. And in particular, he's talking about Christian strangers. And so this could be a lot of different people. Uh, you know, this, this could be people who come to your congregation that you don't know. He says, entertain those people. Well, you know, sometimes I don't feel like making new friends, uh, especially me. I'm kind of an introverted person. It's, it's work for me to go and to shake someone's hand and to, to get to know them. Sometimes I don't feel like entertaining them, uh, not in the sense that you make them laugh, of course, although that's never a bad thing, but, but in the sense that, uh, that you know, you're, you're providing some need that they have. You're having them in their home to feed them lunch. You're, you're getting to know them in some way. Sometimes we don't feel like doing that, but God says, leave that standard where I put that. Entertain Christian strangers. You know, in a group this size, this may not be a problem, but sometimes Christian strangers are the people who have sat uh, opposite pew of you for 20 years, but you've just never really gotten to know them. You might know their name. You might know, uh, you know, where they work or what they do for a living. You might know how many kids they have. You shake their hand every Sunday morning and say, hi, how are you? But, but you've never really gotten to know who they are. How can you consider how to stir up love and good works if you don't know what challenges they're facing? How can you consider them in your mind if you don't know what things that they're good at or, or what ways they can help the kingdom? And so we need to be sure to entertain any kind of Christian stranger. He continues in verse 3, and he tells us to remember the prisoners, the idea of Christians who are in prison. And, uh, and certainly that can be an uncomfortable thing. Going to a prison is not an, a pleasant experience. Maybe you don't like the way the guards treat you. Maybe you don't like being around uh, convicts. Maybe there's any number of reasons why that would be an uncomfortable thing. But God commands us to, to, uh, to remember them. And the idea of remember is to, uh, to take care of them, to provide for their needs. He continues in verse 4 and talks about how marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And so this has a uh, kind of obvious implication. Uh, if you were married, don't stray from your husband or spouse. That, that's how you let brotherly love continue. But this also, he says, has an implication for all Christians. He says that the, uh, the marriage is honorable among all. And so how is it that you and I, as Christians, can uh, stir up love and good works in husbands and wives? Whether you're married and you're talking about other husbands and wives, or whether you're single and you're just talking about those who are married, how do we do that? Well, oftentimes, 
we have a tendency to become a person who uh, people can come to to complain about their spouses. And if you were that person, if, if, if sister so-and-so can come to you to, to vent all of her frustrations and you become a wedge between her and her husband or between a husband and his wife, uh, you know, you're, you'll allow them to come complain to you or anything that you can do that would allow division in a marriage. Instead, we need to be encouraging this couple to become closer, to become more like what God intends them to be, and, and to be, let marriage be honorable among all. And so he encourages us to, to treat it that way. We love Christian marriages. He says we, we, we love Christian strangers, we love Christian prisoners, and we love Christian marriages. And so we consider, how can I stir up love and good works for these kinds of people? In verses 5 and 6, he talks about covetousness and about contentedness. And you know, if you are coveting something of your brother or sister in Christ, that always creates division. You can't want something that they have to the level of covetousness and 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 then th stir up loving good works in them while you desire that. That's always going to come out in some way. And so he says, let's not covet what others have, but instead let's be content with what God has given us. Let's know that God provides for us. In verses 7 through 15, he starts a really interesting section about uh, a love of words, a love of two kinds of words. First, he's going to tell us about a love of the Word of God, and second, he's going to tell us about a love of praising God with our words. Let me show you what I mean. In verse 7, he says, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the Word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And so here, in verse 7, he tells us to remember those who rule over you. This is not necessarily the idea specifically of elders. Here he's referring more to the idea of the apostles, the people who gave us the word of God. And we know that as we continue, because he's talking about uh, those who have spoken the word of God to you. And so they rule over you in the sense that they have given you God's word, and God's word certainly rules over you. And so he says they spoke the word of God to you, you follow their faith, but especially this next part shows us, he says, considering the outcome of their conduct. You know, by the time that the book of Hebrews was written, many of the apostles had already died. You could look at their lives and you could say, this is how they lived their life to the very end. Even that they died for their faith, you can consider their outcome and let that be a motivator to you. He continues in verse 8 and says, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so the idea is, if you love God's word, and you know that Jesus doesn't change, then you know that God's word doesn't change. And so you won't be carried about with various and strange doctrines, as he says in verse 9. And so we have a love of God's word. And certainly we know that we can use God's word to stir up love and good works. We can speak God's word to one another, and, and that is an encouragement to people. That helps people. He continues in verses 10 through 15. He starts to describe some of the things that, that Jesus has done for us. And, and in verse 15, this kind of culminates with him saying, Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And so he says that we need to have a love of praising God with our words. First, we have a love of God's word, but also we love offering the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And so, of course, any time that we speak praise of God to one another, that is an encouragement. That stirs up love and good works. Whenever we come together and we sing together, that, that's a, a way of praising God, and that's a way of encouraging each other. Whenever we, uh, whenever we go to Bible classes, whenever we, we are studying God's word together, and in whatever way that we are praising God, whenever we speak to each other and we, we say, you know, this is what God has done in my life. That's an encouragement to people. This is what God has done in the Bible. This is what God could do for you. These are ways that we stir up love and good works. He calls that a sacrifice of praise. In verse 16, he continues, and he says uh, that we also should have the sacrifice of our hands and our resources to do good works and to share. And, and whenever we uh, do good works, whenever we help out our brothers and sisters in Christ, that is an encouragement. Whenever we share of our resources with our brothers and sisters of Christ, that is an encouragement. And finally, in verse 17, he talks about elders. He says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. You know, elders, they have a great obligation, a great burden on their shoulders. And whether that be the elders of a specific congregation or just any elder that you know, certainly they, they need encouragement maybe more than anyone. 
because they have a lot of weight to carry as far as your soul goes. And so uh, we should do our best to stir up love and to consider the elders that we know and how we can stir up love and good works in them. You know, I'd like us to turn back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. That's some, some practical ways that, that you can stir up love and good works in Hebrews chapter 13. And in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. And so here we're, we're, we're coming back to where we started, this idea of an evil heart of unbelief. And I want us to notice three things in this passage. First, he talks about the evil heart of unbelief. Second, he says, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. And so we have the evil heart of unbelief. We have departing from the living God. He continues in verse 13, and he says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. I want you to notice in verse 13 that when he talks about exhorting one another, and he says, exhort one another daily, who is the person that seems to get the most benefit from it? You know, on the surface, you might be the, think that it's the person who, who is being exhorted. But even if you exhort someone, if they have a hard heart, that might not make any difference to them at all. But notice that he says that the person who really benefits from exhortation is the person doing the exhortation. There's something about when you encourage other people, that softens your heart. And so we have here, we have the evil heart of unbelief. We have departing from the living God. We have exhorting one another daily. Now turn with me back to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, I want us to, to notice that these three elements are still there. These are really parallel passages. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22, he says, Let us draw near with a true heart. And so you have the, the evil heart of unbelief, and you have the true heart, right? We've already discussed that. Second, he says in verse, chapter 3 that you depart from the living God. When you have an evil heart of unbelief, you are leaving God. You are departing from the living God. But here in verse 22, he says that we need to draw near. That when we have a true heart, we come closer to God. And then he continues in verse 25. He says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so in chapter 3, you have exhort one another daily. And then here in chapter 10, you have again exhorting one another. You have all three of these elements in both of these passages. And so, in a way, he's really talking about the same thing here. You know, I've heard a lot of preachers use this verse to talk about how we need to, to be sure that we're here on Sunday mornings. Some preachers will include Sunday evening and Wednesday in this, and they'll say, don't forsake the assembly. You know, this, this is a command to be present every time the doors are open. And I think, I think that that's certainly here. But I think that that's a limiting view of this passage. You know, when you consider that it says in chapter 3 to exhort one another daily, and when you see the parallels between these two passages, the idea is that every time that we can be together, you know, every time that, that one of the members invites you to eat at their house, every time that perhaps you, you come up to the building to, to have prayer together or, or to have a game night or to uh, you know, have, have, go to someone's house to, to sing songs together in whatever way that the brethren are coming together, if you are available, you know, I know sometimes you have jobs, you have things that are going on. You can't literally be at everything that the brethren do. But if you are available, you should have a heart that desires to be with them. You notice that, that if we have an evil heart, we depart from the living God. But if we have a true heart, we draw near. And part of drawing near to God is drawing near to his people, not forsaking the assembling. And that's an important distinction. It doesn't say don't forsake the assembly. It says don't forsake the assembling. Any time that the saints are together, we should desire to be with them and do our best to be together. And if we consider one another, if we think about our weaknesses, our strengths, if we think about, you know, pick one or two people each time that you're going to come together and think, how can I encourage that person today to stir up love and good works? When we come together, it's not going to be a negative time. You know, some congregations struggle with that. I'm sure this one doesn't. But some congregations do. They come together and they leave and you feel disheartened. You feel discouraged just having been there. But, but if we consider one another and we come together and we encourage one another, we will always be glad that we, will, that we have come together and we will eagerly expect the next time, whenever that is, that we can come together, whether that be Sunday morning or just a Thursday afternoon. If you're here this morning and you have not obeyed the gospel, 
perhaps you've, you've heard it preached, perhaps you've studied it for yourself, your faith is growing, but for whatever reason you haven't taken that step yet, you haven't, you haven't confessed, uh, you haven't repented of your sins, you haven't confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which is to say that He's the Lord of your life, He has authority, and, and that He is your Savior, and you haven't been baptized, you haven't been uh, buried and, and died to your sins, buried in those baptismal waters and raised again to new life, I would encourage you in a moment to, to come forward, because this is a great opportunity to do that. Or even if you're not sure, you're not ready, you don't know what it means to obey the gospel, we can study that together. And so in a moment, let's, let's come forward and do that. Or if you're here this morning and you're just afraid that you have not been, uh, you've not been considering one another, you've not been stirring up love and good works, that, that you're not developing a true heart and full assurance of faith, we want to help you with that. We want to pray for you. We want to do whatever we can for you. So we ask that you come forward as we stand and sing.